much for joining us here tonight. It's um, about 7 p.m. in Germany, where I'm um, speaking right now here in Düsseldorf. Uh, it's quite bright outside. It's a little rainy, but uh, so it's actually perfect, perfect webinar weather outside here. Um, thank you very much for joining. So um, yeah, we want to start right away into the topic with minimally invasive techniques for GBR procedures. So why do we need GBR? Um, I mean, when we when we look in all the data, when it when we look at TROP um, after tooth extraction, there is a lot of um, let's say resorption and remodeling potential in the socket. And after tooth extraction, we we usually lose about two thirds up to fifty percent of the of the avular crest within the first weeks um, up to three months. So waiting doesn't help us. So we actually should make sure the remodeling processes um, are on our side. And um, that's one part. But losing bone um, is a major issue when it comes to implant placement, or even when we talk about crowns or Maryland bridges, um, because it doesn't look very nice in the interior region. Other reasons for, um, yeah, let's say, bone loss or not very aesthetic um, situations are, of course, trauma or clefts or cancer or whatever situation, but right now, because it's a situation we can deal with, we look at GBR procedures before or after or um, immediately after tooth extraction. So when we lose a tooth or when we extract a tooth, we lose about 50% of the crest of the distance um, uh, um, palatal to the buccal distance, we lose about 50%. And two thirds about of this distance we lose within the first three months. So within the first weeks, we lose a lot. So waiting is not on our side. So we should treat um, a socket right away or as soon as possible. So we have different situations. Um, obviously we have uh, not only anterior areas where we have to augment bone or um, where we losing bone. We have situations in the anterior, we have situations um, in the posterior region, we have in the upper, in the lower, um, we have different situations and all these situations need different treatment. So we can't say with this single treatment, we can treat all situations. That's, that's not, not possible. Um, so we need different solutions. And different solutions, um, we have plenty of them. They actually come when we when we go back into time, when we go um, when we didn't have any any bone graft and maybe we didn't have any any membranes available. We we took bone from the iliac crest or from the skull and used bone plates, cortical plates, um, to to augment bone. And um, within time, it it got easier because we've got particulated material so situations changed but the kind of the procedures stayed the same because we were thinking we need to kind of screw or we have to maintain the space with kind of maximum invasive therapies um, so even though we got new material the technique stayed the same and so we have the ridge preservation obviously when uh, we extract the tooth to augment the area the socket or the ridge right away at time of tooth extraction and that this is kind of a let's say newer situation but block grafts and sinus lifts and membranes this is kind of old stuff let's say and now we have to think about what is changing um, not only with techniques we have but also with material we have because there's a lot of change within the material and we can use this so when we want to augment the alveolar crest, we have different options, but we also have maxillary sinus and extraction sockets we can focus on. And we have different techniques and we have different um, results when we augment these areas. For the alveolar crest, we know we have um, usually high resorption rates. We have, um, we have more, more mobility for the patient. We have... Um, it's, it's a more complex situation compared to maxillary sinus, which, which is kind of easy. Internal and external sinus augmentation procedures are very safe and extraction socket procedures are also very safe. And I don't want to say easy to do, but when it's working, it's much easier than, um, let's say, a block graft in the lateral uh, lower jaw. 
So we also have different bone grafts um, available on the market. And these are all pictures taken with the same camera, with the same setup. And what we immediately see is there are different colors, there are different textures, the porosity um, looks different, even though we can't, we don't look with the microscope on these um, um, bone grafts. We see um, little, little tiny balls there. We see kind of scraped things. We see blocks, we see more gel-like um, substitutes. And all these materials, they have different, yeah, they are different and they behave different. So when we talk about a bone augmentation procedure and one of my colleagues is using product A and I'm using product B, even though the procedure is the same, it might have a completely different um, result and a diff it's, it's a very complex situation because the products are different. And um, so when we look in the data, in, 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 yeah, in the published data, usually they write something about this or that product, let's say xenogenic bone graft in combination with a, co uh, with a collagen membrane is working very good or it's not very working very good, but the complexity within these collagen membranes or um, within the uh, xenogenic bone materials is much bigger than um, what we were thinking. We also have different membranes and the membranes are some are thicker, some are um, polylactate um, membranes, some are non-resorbing like PTFA, titanium reinforced, some are um, completely disassembled and put newly or newly built together like the OSIX membrane. Um, we have membranes from the pericadium, we have, um, we have different types of membranes and they're all called collagen membrane. Some are cross-linked, yes, but some are cross-linked with glutaraldehyde some are cross-linked with uh, formaldehyde and some are cross-linked with ribose. Completely different type of membrane, but we all say it's a cross-linked membrane. So we have to be a little bit more careful because porosity, resorption profile, also the handling um, and the soft tissue reaction is completely different. What they all have in common, they have no nutrition. They're kind of, they have to heal into the tissues inside, into the bony tissue or soft tissue and this is done through diffusion. And um, this takes about 10 days for, for an early stage for the first nutrition. And then a few months until the bone graft or the membrane is kind of fully healed into uh, the bone. And what I, what I really like when, when we talk with colleagues, the handling makes a huge, huge point. They usually say the handling is good or the handling is better of a membrane. But when we turn back the time, when we started dealing with membranes, this wasn't easy. No matter what type of membrane we had, it was kind of something new we had to learn. So handling shouldn't be the, the issue or shouldn't be the thing we talk about because we should actually focus on how the situation looks like at the end when we place an implant or how the patient is, how the morbidity is. That's a much more important point. And when the handling is supreme, then, um, then it's okay, but the handling shouldn't be the first thing. So are all materials the same? No, they aren't. And if we look into histologies where we augmented bone in a lateral defect situation and have a look at a native collagen membrane versus a ribose crosslink membrane, and the ribose crosslink membrane is obviously the OSIX plus membrane with the same bone graft. We see in the upper picture, the native collagen membrane, we see these yeah, bone particles um, com, yeah, um, um, grown into soft tissue. And we also see that the membrane, the stability of the membrane wasn't maybe that good because somehow some particles went into the soft tissue and didn't stay in our augmented site anymore, even though we used pin, pins to, to fixate the membrane. So somehow this membrane, the resorption profile of this membrane is much faster than we yeah, expected it to be or we needed it to be. In the lower picture, same bone graft. It's again, it's the same bone graft. It's this very slow resorbing particulated bone material, xenogenic material. We still see some parts of the membrane there, 
but we also see a very, very nicely healed bone with no soft tissue impacted in the particulated material. And if you ask me what I would like to have when I would need an implant, I actually would like the lower situation much more because um, I would love to have healed bone and not soft tissue impacted with um, particulated material. Because when we talk about um, inflammation and soft tissue reaction, we have a lot of soft tissue reaction and inflammation in the upper part. And that's something we all have seen before when, when patients tell us, ah, I have the feeling I, I chill on sand. And we say, yeah, it's, it's not a big deal. It's no problem, it's normal. Yes, it's normal because we might use a, a wrong membrane. So what are the GBR principles? What do we actually want when we talk or what do we actually talk about when we talk about GBR um, procedures? So what we want, we wanna have a stabilization not only of the hard tissues, but also soft tissue because soft tissue is, yeah, is, is, is much more important sometimes than the hard tissue. We know that hard tissue is important around implants, but we also know that soft tissue is preventing shrinkage and uh, remodeling of hard tissues if we have enough. So soft tissue is something really important. So we want to have a good um, interaction between the soft tissue and the membrane when we augment. And the healing of the bone graft should, um, number one, give us good volume. But the volume should not only be volume, but also very nicely healed bone with a low amount of soft tissue. Should have a nice blood supply so everything can heal. The soft tissue should not have any complications. And when we have complications, I would like to have a membrane where I can trust that these complications heal maybe better or with less complications for the bone graft than using a different type of membrane. So membranes aren't the same, like bone grafts aren't the same. And for the patient, I would like to have a technique and also material where the mobility stays low, where surgical site heals nicely, and maybe the surgical time needed is low. And also the time I need to not only to augment, but also to wait until I can place my implant after augmenting is, um, is kind of always the same. And I'm um, at, my second, um, at my second stage surgery um, or my second surgery, I don't have any um, yeah, unforeseen situations. So why then, why we use pins, screws or block grafts? Um, why don't we use just one type of, of yeah, surgical procedure? Why do we have pins and screws? Well, when we go back in time, they were only the block grafts and then membranes came and we needed to stabilize the membrane because the membrane was so easy or attached, the, the attachment of the membrane was so much to the soft tissues that we needed the pin fixation, not only for the stability for the bone graft, like for the volume, but to make sure the membrane is not moving. And um, well, um, when, we, when we talk about handling, um, that's actually not very nice because it would be nicer if we do not need pins. So the, the, whole, th the, 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 the whole story behind it is we need a scaffold. That was the block graft, that was the cortical shield, that was everything. We need a scaffold to make sure inside the scaffold will be bone when we open up it again and place our implant. So um, Miyamari and Mertens, um, they had a look on what type of technique give or will give us a very nice volume. And they had a look at um, different type of procedure, same procedure, but different type of techniques. So they used particulated bone with and without a membrane. Oh no, sorry, with a membrane. And they used the same particulated bone materials with a pinned membrane. And they also used a block graft. And then they made a comb CT and mirrored on in different, in different levels. And yeah, they saw that particulated bone with a membrane, no pin fixation, they're losing about, let's say, one, 1 1.5 millimeter. With a pinned membrane, they're losing a lot less because the, the, the material can't be pressed epically because the pins are fixated in the membrane. So it's, it's kind of with a balloon, it's, it's, it's blocking themselves. So these, these particulated material can't be pushed epically because of the pins. So they're losing less volume there. And then, no surprise, with the bone block, they're losing the least um, volume because the bone block is very stable and screw retained. 
So, um, yeah, going to low invasive techniques because these techniques are, let's say, um, membranes pin fixated are the least issue when it comes to um, um, invasive techniques, but a bone block, maybe also from the lower jaw, it's kind of invasive. We need two surgical sites, um, the time for surgery, surgical time is increasing because we have to shape this bone block and um, patients usually do not like it that much. It's working very nicely and working give us very, very nice bone, but maybe there is something different what we can do. So what we have on one side is that we can augment our, um, our ridge at time of tooth extraction using ridge preservation. It's nice because it's one stage. Um, it's a kind of the same procedure like um, doing an immediate implant. It's a one stage situation. We um, extract the tooth, augment the side, let it heal, place the implant. So we kind of can make from a more difficult situation, we can turn the situation in an easier situation because we have a lot of bone in the area we want to, we need it. Or we could use tenting screws because a tenting screw, like when we use, when we look at a tent, a tenting screw is holding up our scaffold. And when we kind of um, go back again, we, we have our bone block. The bone block is fixated with pins or with screws. And when we take away the block and leave the screws in there, we still have the same situation when we have a good, good membrane because the screws are holding up the scaffold area with, uh, with the membrane or the membrane is be holding up with the screws. Um, so we actually don't need a lot of bone there. And it's much easier, it's faster. You can use it spontaneously, um, especially in situations where you think you can place an implant and maybe don't need any bone augmentation because it looks very nicely healed and everything is fine and you open it up and you have a big defect. You can actually yeah, augment everything very, very fast with particulated material and then use your, your screw to give it additional fixation and additional like space fixation um, for your scaffold. Um, so is it really working that well? Well, there are some um, publications that you, that you actually can see in surgical pictures and videos that it's, that it's working fine, that you see the screw head is um, usually impacted in bone and everything looks fine. But in the direct comparison with, um, with in volume, um, this wasn't done before. So what, what I did is as Mertens checked different membranes, pin fixated and bone blocks as Miyamari did, I was doing the same thing. I was looking um, at a pin fixated, not pin fixated, but at a um, particulated material with a collagen membrane versus a collagen membrane with a tending screw. And we used two different types of membranes. And um, so we had four groups as well. And our results were that we're losing about one millimeter in the group where we're using particulated membrane, particulated material with a membrane, with a collagen membrane. Um, so kind of comparable with Memari and Mertens, but we're losing about 0 0.3, 0 0.35 millimeters uh, when we're using a tenting screw. So and that's very similar, very close to what Memari and Mertens had in the bone block part. So with a with a yeah low invasive technique because particulated material you can take it out of the box you have a tenting screw it's also easy um, to use because when you're usually using bone blocks um, you have the, the screws there yeah you, know? you just don't place a block anymore and um, it's it's yeah very very easy to handle and you can um, use it spontaneously and you have the same same scaffold you have the same dimension after wound closure compared to your bone block. That's how it looks like. On the left side, there's the defect. We place the screw, um, covered it with particulated bone, and we had two types of membrane. This is um, like an O6 plus membrane, and we used a native collagen membrane as well, and then tension-free wound closure, and then we had cone beam CTs checking um, this volume or the situation before and after wound closure. And this is what you see. You see um, in the green and the blue area, you see the, the situations with no tenting screw, and you see these, um, these black, black bars within the green and black 
um, bars. Um, and it's kind of a step going up. So when you look at the C um, on the X axis, um, that's kind of the coronal aspect where we're losing the most because after wound closure, even though it's tension free, we have the most pressure on our augmented sides and the particulated material is being pressed apically. So it has to go to the medium aspect first and before it goes apically. Um, so we kind of increasing um, volume there. So we have less shrinkage in this area compared to the coron aspect. And then obviously in the apical aspect because the wound closure, some soft tissue tension is also pressing material from the medium aspect in the apical aspect, we're losing less volume in the apical um, aspect. And that's what you can see in the green and the blue area. You can actually see it in the orange and the red bars as well, but this was tension, tenting screw. So we're actually gaining volume in the apical um, area and we're not losing much volume in the coronal aspect. And I mean, less than 0.5 millimeter is really all, almost nothing. Um, what we also wanted to do and show is how the ribose cross linked, so the OSIX membrane is behaving in combination with soft tissue. Um, so the adhesion we want to show versus some type of um, native collagen membrane. And we were actually not able to do it because the native collagen membrane was so attached to the soft tissue that um, it we were not able to show any movement. But when we see that the native collagen membranes usually are attached to um, the soft tissues a lot, then we have to either pin fixate it because every movement is kind of transported from the soft tissue to our membrane and from the membrane to bone. And when we think about healing, bone doesn't like movement when it comes to healing and everything what's moving is, um, yeah, is resolving faster. So it's actually not a big, big surprise that the native collagen membrane is resolved much faster and that we have these issues with um, kind of soft tissue growing inside the bone particles because the membrane isn't there anymore. And the ribose crossing membrane just stayed on our augmented side on the particulated bone material when we opened up the flap again to kind of measure the movement. So there was no adhesion to the soft tissue. And that's also the reason why we don't need to pin fixate the OSIX plus membrane because it's not yeah, combined. There's no adhesion between the soft tissues and the, um, yeah, the membrane. So it's a, it's a real barrier and that's what we wanna have. So what, we, what, we need, that, well, what do we need? We need a good combination between a bone graft and a barrier membrane. So um, it's not like you take product A and product B and you do, you do a GBR. It's, it's, yeah, it's much more sensible. Um, we need the ideal bone graft is volume stable and obviously has no foreign body reaction, is resolvable, so it turns into bone. And um, I'm not aware of, um, of this ideal bone graft. The ideal membrane, but we have good, good bone grafts. Yeah? We have really, really nice bone grafts, obviously, but um, the perfect ideal bone graft doesn't exist besides human bone. Um, the ideal membrane is has an extended resorption rate, has a good barrier function, but no soft tissue ingrowth, has um, yeah, no soft tissue reaction, and um, yeah, stays there in place. And if it turns into bone because it's so stable, this would be a nice effect. Because if a membrane can turn into bone, then obviously it has to be very stable because we know that when there is movement, there is no turning into bone of anything. So when we have a look at ribose cross-linked membranes, like the OSIX bus membrane is, um, it has a very slow resorption profile. And this helps the, um, um, the, the augmented side to be covered with the membrane for a very long time. And this long time is that it can be exposed. It's, it's a multi-layer um, membrane. So when we, when we leave it exposed, for example, after a rich preservation technique, um, the saliva and bacteria, they, they have to kind of dig through multiple layers within this membrane um, to kind of go to um, our, our particulated bone material. But um, at, the same, at the same second and at the same situation, the soft tissue growth is also um, closing our um, extraction socket. So at the time the extraction socket is closed, 
the membrane is usually still intact and covering um, yeah, or separating the membrane from the bone graft. So it's actually a, a perfect situation because we're not moving the mucogingival junction. We have a lot of attached or keratinized tissue in an area we want it. And we have a very little soft tissue reaction. It's a little bit more than with native collagen membranes because it's obviously cross-linked. So the growth um, above um, an O6 plus membrane is a little slower than um, over a native collagen membrane, but that's because the native collagen membrane is kind of gone. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's not a really perfect ideal um, um, barrier function, it has no barrier function like probably. Um, and the O6 plus membrane can turn into bone because it's so stable, even though it's not pin fixated um, and it, it's, yeah, it's separated from the soft tissue. So there's no, no movement of this membrane um, coming from the soft tissues. So when we look at, um, at uh, high magnification, we can, we can see these multi, multi layers. And this is why, this is what makes the O6 plus membrane so ideal when it comes to um, to, to barrier with the barrier function. Yeah. So let's have a look. Why why should we do ridge preservation? I mean, in the left picture where we have the buccal bone still in, in intact, um, should we do or do we need um, 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 ridge preservation? Well, I mean, this is a situation where we could actually think about um, immediate placement of an implant because we have a buccal bone plate and um, we, have a, we have enough bone, sufficient bone in the palatal aspect. So we could place an implant there and um, not talking about ridge preservation, but we can also do ridge preservation because then we will definitely have perfect bone. In the right picture, um, we maybe don't have any buccal bone plate anymore and the tooth is kind of on top of our ridge. So extracting this tooth will lead to not only a collapse of bone, but also of soft tissues. So doing a rich preservation um, procedure here will prevent our soft tissue to collapse. And um, when we, in the same situation, can kind of grow more soft tissue than, um, than not than we need, but more than we had before, this will help us to place an implant later. Um, and as we're talking about the anterior region, the aesthetic region, more soft tissue usually leads to nicer aesthetic results. So rich preservation for me is not only to gain bone, but it's more to prevent soft tissue from collapsing. So, um, and that's again, the EFP workshop from 2019, um, when we have a look, best effect, xenogenic or allergenic bone material with collagen membrane, rich preservation reduces horizontal and vertical rich shrinkage. Yeah, it's great, but what type of xenogenic or allergenic bone material and what type of collagen membrane? And um, there are definitely some materials, bone materials and collagen membranes, they don't work properly together. And there are other materials that work great together. So please make sure you're using or you're trying maybe different bone materials within, with different collagen membranes to get the best results. And I really like um, the um, cross-linked membrane because we don't need a primary wound closure. We can fill up the socket with bone. And we, after seven days, we're removing the sutures. And usually it looks like this. There's no, no really inflammation. It's, um, the volume is still there. And then when we open up the site for implant placement, we usually have very, very nicely healed bone um, with no soft tissue ingrowth. So it's hard, very, very good bone and um, not this three millimeter on top, um, you, can, you can scrape away. So let's have a look in the video. Um, it's a, let's say a normal situation. We, um, we have to separate a crown or a bridge to, to remove a tooth. And um, we, we were planning a rich preservation procedure. So we extracting the tooth. It's like a very, very straightforward situation. And um, if, if you, if, yeah, and, but there are always surprises. And you sometimes, no matter how much you, you plan and how much you, how careful you are, sometimes the situations are different. 
um, when you when you open up the situation or when you extract the tooth. So at the moment we extracted the tooth and cleaned the socket, we realized that um, there's a fenestration defect to the buckle. So we opened up everything because usually it's more difficult to, to clean everything properly um, through the socket. Um, so it's easier to raise a flap, little tiny flap. And um, we see a huge fenestration defect or a larger fenestration defect. We can clean everything properly um, and carefully because we see everything. And then the next question is how should we, or what should we do? What type of um, membrane should we use? What type of bone graft should we use here? Should we use a different type of um, membrane because now the defect is larger? And that's something I really like about um, the OSIX plus membrane, no matter how, how big the defect is, how, no matter how difficult the situation is, you can usually use it and um, leave it exposed. So we filling up this, um, um, the site with a xenogenic bone material in combination with um, some hyaluronic acid then replacing the, um, um, the O6 plus membrane on top and we're closing the site and we're leaving everything exposed. And um, usually or when, when I went to university and um, uh, yeah, and the professor said, you can leave a membrane exposed. This was, this was strange because um, usually they said you have to really cover the membrane because it's a, it's a collagen membrane. It's, um, it's nothing human and you have to cover it. Otherwise it will resolve very fast or you get a huge inflammation. But this type of membrane you can leave exposed and this makes everything very easy because you don't have to close the flap completely. You just leave it like it was. So you can bring the flap right in the position you had it before. It's healing very nicely. And um, yeah, that's it. So this is the situation how it looked at time of um, tooth extraction and on the right side it's at the time of re-entry and let's let's look how it looks like when we have the second stage so um so number one we have very very nicely healed thick soft tissues attached keratinized um, mucosa here um, so that's number one and you know it was exposed in the very beginning um, and now what you can see when we raise the flap you see nicely healed bone but you also see in a few seconds, the texture of the bone looks like the texture of the membrane. And um, this can also only happen when um, the bone, when the membrane turns into bone because it's, it's stable and it was stabilized to yeah, nothing. We didn't have any, any pins. We didn't have any sutures in place. And that's what you see very, very frequently and in a very, yeah, yeah, that's what you actually always see um, when you open up the, the area after bone augmentation, you see bone um, in the texture of the membrane. And in the area where the soft tissue has some movement, like after the mucogenital junction, obviously the membrane has some movement, just a little tiny bit, because it's not like 100% um, yeah, attached and stable and quiet. So um, the membrane didn't turn into bone, but it's still there. And that's four and a half, five months after um, the socket preservation or ridge preservation technique. So in this situation, you can really easily place implants and you have enough bone with no soft tissue ingrowth in the shoulder region. And this will most likely prevent um, issues or larger inflammation situations like periimplantitis in the future. Like the situation here, a um, little different, um, different procedure. Um, we, um, yeah, the, the, the idea was to place an implant here. We um, augmented the site at time of um, tooth extraction and it didn't work. And sometimes it doesn't work. So we don't know why, but most likely there was too much movement. There was not enough stability of the bone. Um, so what can we do to give, enough, give the situation enough stability? Um, and what we do is we're using tenting screws. Um, so we placed a pen tenting screw inside um, this situation, inside this bony defect. And the screw head is exactly um, in the position where number one, the ridge was, and number two, 
the implant shoulder will be later on. Then we filling up everything with particulated bone material, placing an OSIX plus membrane above, and then closing the site. And when we open up everything, you see some of the membrane is um, yeah is movable, um, like it's moving in the in the lower aspect. Um, but in the top part, you see that the, that some so, some of the the membrane is starting into turning into bone and giving us this very very um, a typical. Um, texture of bone looking like a membrane. And um, yeah, that's what you see. And then when you remove kind of these particles of the membrane, you see the screw head is covered into bone. You remove the screw head and you can place an implant in a, in a perfect three-dimensional position. And everything else is very straightforward because um, you have enough soft tissues, you have enough bone, you can screw retain it, the crown, the final crown, if you want to. You can do whatever you want because everything else is a very, very nicely healed situation. So why is the membrane so important? Um, it's, it, the membrane should be a barrier. And um, that's something you, you can see in publications. That's something you can read about in publications that these um, yeah, top three millimeters sometimes are very soft and that's something all of you and all of us actually experience when we when we when we're actually not sure should we remove it and augment again or um, is it is it okay that we that we leave it? But um, I don't like it, and that's that's a biopsy six millimeters and three of it are impacted um, bone particles in soft tissues, and underneath yeah we have nice bone, but the top three millimeters aren't very nice bone. And when we place implants in this area, we have like the top three millimeter of our implants in, in this very, let's say, soft tissue mesh situation. And um, I don't want to have it. And Daniel Thoma did a very nice research on this. Um, he looked if we, is there a need to remove the biomaterial? And no, there is no need, it, it will heal. It gives us a very stable um, situation. The volume is great, but when we have a closer look, the bone to implant contact is lower in the situation where um, the soft tissue ingrowth um, particulated bone material wasn't removed. And bone to implant contact is, for me at least, very important when it comes to an osseointegrated implant and long term stability. So, here again, on the left side, we're looking now at rich preservation procedures. We're having an OSIX plus membrane plus a slow resorbing um, bone graft and the whole socket is filled with bone and you don't see these particles anymore. Um, we don't have any, any ingrowth of soft tissues. And on the right side, we were using a native collagen membrane plus a slow resorbing bone graft, exactly the so same slow resorbing bone graft than on the other side. And we see a very, very nice volume. The volume is very stable. That, it, that's perfect. So it helps us to kind of keep the soft tissues in place, the volume is perfect, everything is nice. But when we have a closer look, it's actually that we lost this top part, like almost one third, maybe half of the whole socket is gone because um, it's particulated bone impacted with soft tissue. And that's what we can use. Um, it's, it's soft, it's, um, I don't want to have it because of this bone to implant contact is lower, is not as good as when we have um, very nicely healed bone. And another situation is when we have an infection, um, we can always deal with bone much better when we don't have soft um, tissue impacted bone graft materials in an infection site because this will number one either resolve and we have a huge defect or we can just screw it, um, yeah, take it away. So we, that's something we don't like. And um, nicely healed bone usually is, um, is better when it comes to, to infections. So how does the OSIX plus membrane um, react when we have fast resolving bone grafts? And that's on the left side. And it's also, it looks nice. We all even can see some part of the membrane still in place. O6 plus plus so resorbing bone graft in, in the middle um, looks nicely, still perfect, um, perfect ridge. And we have some um, yeah, parts of the membrane still in place. 
And then the picture we, from the very beginning, it was pin fixated. So there shouldn't be any movement of the membrane. And um, yeah, we have bone material impacted with soft tissues and we have soft tissue inside the, um, yeah, and we have bone graft inside the soft tissue. And this is leading to local reactions because it has to, um, the body has to react on it, has to get rid of it. It's sometimes because of these sharp little, little um, fragments of the bone graft are kind of um, are cutting through the soft tissues so or little infections um, in the soft tissue sometimes. And yeah, that's when the patient is coming saying, um, I have some, 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 it's, it's, it's itching there and it feels strange. And then you take um, the forceps and you can remove part of the bone graft through the soft tissues, through the healed soft tissue. That's something I don't really like. So let's have a look um, how, how I do it. Um, it's a situation um, where we're not able to, to preserve, uh, restore the tooth. We had to extract it and the complete buckle, member, uh, buckle bone plate was gone. And obviously um, we, can, we can now just let it heal and um, yeah, augment the situation later on. But then we're losing so much soft tissue. The bone augmentation isn't the big issue, but the soft tissue. So um, helping the soft tissue or preventing the soft tissue from collapsing will help us to, um, to get a nicer, uh, more aesthetic situation. So I'm placing an O6 plus membrane, then I'm using um, 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 allogenic bone material here um, in combination with uh, a hyaluronic acid, then placing it inside the socket and flipping the O6 plus membrane just under the palatal um, palate side of, um, of the soft tissues. And I'm leaving it like this um, and then I let it heal. And um, after three, three and a half, four months, I have very nicely healed bone. I still see um, the membrane in place and um, I have enough volume. I have a nice soft tissue. I can place an implant in a nice position and resort with a final crown. That's a different situation. Um, we had to place an implant here because we didn't want to um, yeah, open up the site as often um, to make sure we're not losing the papilla height and um, producing scar tissues. So we're placing the implant in the correct position and then augmenting the buckle aspect of the implant. So we have bone material covering it with O6 plus membrane to gain more volume of soft tissue. We're using um, um, connective tissue grafts and uh, closing up the site. And um, after heating period, we have a nice volume and then um, with the final crown. But you will really have a lot of bone there. And this was a coincidence because we had to take and comb CT later for a different situation. And when we look here um, after, after the healing period, then we see the bone was actually in place onto the um, shoulder region of the implant. Even though we didn't do anything, we just let it heal. We didn't pin fixate the membrane. We didn't do um, a second surgery there. We just left it. So it's a very, very secure way to augment um, um, bony, bony defects. So the conclusion takeaways are focus on the membrane and focus on the interaction between membrane and the bone material, um, especially when it comes to augmentation. Sometimes go, go a step back and maybe don't use bone blocks. Maybe just think about the scaffold idea and use a tenting screw to stabilize the volume. Um, use maybe ridge preservation techniques to prevent later augmentations. And when you use ridge preservation, you don't need to fully close the flap when you need the right membrane. And please, volume isn't equal bone. And um, when you have soft bone, think about the bone to implant contact. Um, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, it was a great pleasure being here with you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, doctor. Just a second. Right, um, before we will go to the Q&A, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Perfect. All right. So I, I hope everybody does as well. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, um, 
I would like to ask everybody here to fill out the feedback survey, which you can access either by scanning the QR code on screen or using the link on the chat pane. Uh, please dedicate only two minutes to fill it out for our future improvements. Your opinion is highly important to us and we really appreciate it. I would also like to uh, inform everybody of our next webinars. So next week on uh, June the 2nd, Dr. Peter Ramzetsofer will be back here for the fourth uh, session. Uh, on June 16th, uh, Dr. Gerardo Chacon will discuss about periodontal and peri-implant plastic and reg regenerative uh, microsurgery. And on June 21st, Dr. Fred Silva will start his uh, series of lectures. Um, the, the, uh, the first part will be focusing on barrier membrane uh, stabilization and the lasso technique. To review the entire uh, list of events, you're all more than welcome to enter the new Dayton Dentals website. Um, so, as promised, uh, Dr. Kaufman, uh, there are a few questions uh, in the Q&A, so if you will. Yeah, um, I will start with the chat because um, there was a very early question. If there are any okay. differences regarding tenting screws, uh, titanium or stainless steel, and the size of the head of the screw. Um, thank you very much for this very nice question. Um, there are some, um, some companies um, claiming that, um, or they have some special um, yeah, tenting screw, screws um, in their portfolio with a larger head, which is kind of very smooth. Um, to be honest, um, they're very nice. Um, I sometimes didn't have them, so I was just using normal screws. Um, I was, the, the screws you see there um, from the firma Meisinger, um, a German company, and um, yeah, I didn't see any, any differences. Um, I used um, titanium screws, and the head of the screw didn't play a big role for me. Um, the length was about 10 millimeters or longer. Um, shorter screws um, do have the, diff the, the difficulty because you have to yeah, screw retain it into the bone and then you need some still some length outside or inside your, your defect area. So it should be at least 10 millimeters of length what you should use. Um, yeah, so for me, the head of the screw doesn't play a big role so far. Um, so then, um, then there's a question. My experience is that the OSIX membrane tears very easily. For example, when using a suture for fixation, um, has that um, problem been improved with OSIX Plus? Um, so I'm not using um, pins, screws, or um, usually um, sutures to um, hold the membrane in place. So um, it tears still easily. Um, that's what people say, the, there's a handling issue, but um, as you don't have to pin fixate it and you don't have to yeah, screw retain it or you don't have to um, use um, fixation sutures, um, yeah, there is no, no need to kind of get the risk of tearing the membrane. And in the video you might have seen, there was a little tear inside the membrane and it doesn't make any difference um, when it's not in the exposed area. So when it's covered with soft tissue, usually it's not, not a big problem. Um, so yeah, as I'm, yeah, I would recommend not to pin fixate, pin fixate or uh, use sutures to hold the membrane in place. There's really no need to it. Um, so there was, um, there's a question, is really bone histological after simultaneous implant placement and horizontal augmentation? Obviously we don't do any biopsy here, um, but um, the situation looks very stable. So we, as we, we have micro CTs in, um, in, um, in different situations, not of humans, obviously, we have uh, comium CTs of different situations. Uh, we have histologies um, from other species we, um, we, we, we see that the bone looks completely healed. So we think it's, it's bone there, but we won't do any biopsy in this area. So in the um, Q and A section, uh, where's the pin placed for tenting um, along buckled bone plate or in the apical portion of the socket? How many screws? So how many screws? Um, it really depends on, this, on the defect size. Um, when it's, um, I would say one screw per tooth. Um, 
So when you, for example, in the lower aspect, when you want to augment um, a larger area, for example, you lost tooth number, um, yeah, the pre, let's say the premolar international way because Americans and Europeans um, count differently. Um, you lost the, the two premolars and one molar, I would place three tenting screws for each tooth, one tenting screw. Um, I would place it in, um, in the buckle plate, um, but sometimes a little lower with a slight angulation towards, um, towards the um, coronal aspect. And then the head of the screw should be in the position where you want to have your ridge or where you had your ridge uh, previously and where your shoulder region is. Um, so do not over augment. This, this is not working. Yeah? Then you have some shrinkage and then, um, but you're not losing much bone. You usually have sometimes the screw head um, yeah, working through the soft tissue. So do not over augment the side with a tenting screw. Um, and um, what you can also do when you not only need vertical and horizontal, you can place um, screws not only towards the buckle, but also to the crestal portion that you place it really in the apex, apex region and then have it um, horizontally outside or in a vertical position, the screw um, for horizontal and vertical augmentation. Um, what is your attitude of grafting in an effect, in, in effect, infected site? Um, so when we clean um, the infected site of, um, of a socket after, rich, uh, after tooth extraction, I don't see any issues. But that's the reason why we re usually raise a flap when we, when we, when we can't be 100% sure that we removed everything to be sure that we removed everything. Because when we leave some infected material and granulation tissue in the socket, obviously it's not working properly. So usually we raise a flap or in, few, in, in yeah, some cases we raise a flap. Do you fill the void uh, created by tenting screws upon implant placement with bone graft material or do you leave that as it is? Do you fill the void created by tenting screws upon implant placement? With yeah, I definitely fill the void um, with a bone graft material, particulated material. Um, I really like faster resolving materials um, which turn into bone and um, after a while um, turn completely into bone. And with this, um, um, yeah, with this technique, with this nice membrane in combination with the tenting screw, I get nice, nice results. Um, do you use any specific sutures? Um, well, um, coming from university, I use PTFE sutures um, and um, yeah, monophilic um, sutures uh, 6 and 5 only. Um, and that's what I'm using in, uh, in the private office as well. So I have, um, yeah, I have a company called Biotex um, sutures I'm using, um, but I'm also using um, um, Gore-Tex sutures um, 5.0 and uh, Pseudoplast sutures 5.0. These, um, yeah, these sutures I'm using um, PTFE and then I'm using uh, polypropylene and sutures uh, 6.0 or 7.0. Um, yeah, with a yeah, with a very sharp needle. But that's something use use the suture you like. Um, try some. Um, I would really recommend uh, PTFE, even though they're a little bit more expensive, and also um, also um, seven O or six O sutures of polypropylene or any other type of nylon material. Um, in the case you presented, would you be as a filler? Yeah, so um, I like Ossix bone um, and I used it and I have it also um, in my office. And um, when I do uh, tooth extractions um, in some situations, I'm using the Ossix bone plus a membrane and um, using Ossix bone as a filler will definitely work. But um, it's sometimes, we have to talk about money sometimes and um, it's sometimes a little bit more expensive. So I'm not using it in every, every situation, but it's definitely a very, very nice material. Also it's, it's actually very impressive how Ossix bone turn in, turns into bone, um, not only what you see clinically, but you also what you see in histologies. It's, it's very impressive. So you can do that and it's definitely working because it's a very, very nice um, yeah, grafting material. 
um, your opinion about allergenic bone, uh, your opinion about allergenic bone blocks in primary reconstruction. I am very suspicious at long term. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not using bone blocks. I did some cases, um, some cases, but um, I don't have any real long term data. And um, yeah, I'm not the right person to ask. Sorry. Um, big is um, is the bone to implant contact. So when you place an implant. Then you have the implant shoulder in the apex and we have to focus on the implant shoulder and the big is measured from the implant shoulder where the first contact to bone is measured or is seen in histology so we usually want to have bone at the implant shoulder or where the yeah, rough part of the implant is so when the bone to implant contact is lower then we have a part where no bone is actually attached to the implant and it's important because, um, yeah, when we think about um, perimplantitis or um, other inflammation, when the bone is not attached to the implant, the rough part of the implant is more or less not impacted in the bone. So it's um, easier for bacteria and um, also for um, biofilm to go to the implant. So yeah, big bone implant contact and it's important. Sorry, very nice question. Um, yeah, I have ex I have um, experience with Volumax. So do you have any experience with Volumax? I do. Um, and um, I, I like the Volumax for um, when we have a second stage surgery and we see that um, we're missing some volume in the buccal aspect, I'm using Volumax sometimes. Um, but usually my, my material or my, vault, my, my membrane to go with is the O6 plus. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you so very much for your time, effort and professional input. And thank you everybody for joining us today. And I hope to see you all in our next event. So thank you everybody and have a great day.